Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Yet again, another murder in Beersheba, Israel, this time uh, as a young mother who was in the car with three of her young children there was shot and murdered uh, while they're on the road in Beersheba. Again, the Intifada is still underway. Jewish authorities right now are still saying that it could be the case of... Uh, of uh, either a revenge attack or it could be the case of just a uh, burglary gone wrong. Uh, they say that the mother was the wife of a police officer in Israel. But I, on the other hand, do not agree with that. It is obviously, once again, another murder of the Intifada. Uh, and that brings us to a very interesting article and by the way, this is a very depth, in-depth prophetic look that we're going to take tonight. We're going to be looking in the book of Daniel. But before we get to the book of Daniel, which actually you guys don't even see this on your screen. I just realized that. Let me see if we can't change this around because you should be able to see this as I'm doing this. Hang on. Okay. It keeps popping up. There we go. There we go. All right, we can still come back to it in just a moment. But anyhow, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, a, is, uh, his, he's calling his intifada a peaceful, popular uprising. Can you believe that? It's really hard to believe that he's actually saying that. Uh, this Flash 90 photo here of him on Israel National News. Anyway, the Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas met with officials of his Fatah faction last Wednesday. During the meeting, Abbas once again expressed his support for the French politi political initiative, which seeks to set up a group uh, of the Permanent Security Council members, some Arab and European states, and international organizations. There is a need to convene. Uh, an international peace conference in order to extract the current deadlock in the peace process and that the Palestinians intend to appeal the Security Councils to get resolutions which will cease all settlements in the Palestinian territory, said Abbas. Abbas dubbed the current intifada as a popular peaceful uprising, initiated as a uh, pro-proportional uh, pro response to the occupation. This is just really insane. I mean, you cannot think of any better way to describe his uh, remarks to uh, the Intifada and to saying a peaceful demonstration. But then again, I'm reminded by uh, Louis Jean Toron, the Cardinal of the Vatican, who Guglielmo Miotti quoted in 2011 that stated that there will not be peace in Jerusalem until the holy sites are resolved. And then also we see in Hillary Clinton's uh, private emails that were released under uh, the court uh, order in America that her own aides were telling her to incite peaceful, quote unquote, peaceful demonstrations uh, in Jerusalem to get them back to the negotiating table. So if Abbas calls this peaceful, what really is peace then? Is butchering people the peace that they're looking for? It's hard to say. Anyway, moving on in other news as well. This here is on uh, uh, Before It's News. A very interesting article by Lisa Haven. Don't believe the one world religion is here. You will after seeing this, and you won't believe what religion they adopt. We've been sounding this trumpet for many, many years, telling the people when they look to the Muslim Antichrist, or excuse me, a Muslim Mahdi to be the Antichrist, they say that he'll bring about a one world religion, a one world government. Many people say this about the coming Antichrist. Now, I can't say that Lisa agrees in the Pope being the Antichrist personally. I think she believes him to be the false prophet. But I did really appreciate the article she had here. It says 14 world religions and over 1,000 religious leaders participated in the first annual Commemoration World Alliance of Religions Peace Summit, a signing ceremony for the ultimate forger of the one world religion. They signed the Unity of Religion Agreement, a promise of religions to unite unconditionally and without discrimination to achieve world peace. Religious leaders who attended the ceremony included those from the Shia Islam faith, to those of the evangelical faith, to the Catholicism, to Hinduism, to Buddhism, 
uh, to the Anglican, to the Sheikh, to the Judaism, and many others. Their goal, a one-world religion under the papacy, she writes. And she actually gives you the, the article there where you can see this for yourself, including uh, a clip here of the video of this particular signing uh, uh, ceremony that was going on, which a lot of people have been sharing uh, on social media here on Facebook. A lot of people have been doing that already. I think it's really worth that you look at it. We have included on Israeli News Live on our Facebook page of Israeli News Live. Take a look at that. Uh, you'll find that interesting. Another thing that she shared with me, I asked about this, and she shared with me, and I want you to listen to this, uh, just about two minutes of this clip here. Now, this was back in September last year. This is when the Pope of Rome goes to uh, New York, and again, another interreligious bringing the churches together dialogue. Take a look at this right here. Papa Francesco, on behalf of this very distinguished group, representatives of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Native American, Jewish, Islamic, and Christian communities of New York City, our civic and public officials and the board of the September 11th Memorial Foundation, I renew to you our welcome and our joy at your visit. Welcome, Holy Father. You can see that he is the predominant figure here, guys. Let's listen a little bit more. I want you to hear this up to about 3 minutes and 50 seconds. Now, I can tell you, Papa Francesco, we in New York are sinners. We are sinners. We have many flaws. We make many mistakes. But one of the things we do very well is sincere and fruitful interreligious friendship. Interreligious friendship. Came here for religious freedom. And they found in New York City an atmosphere of respect and appreciation for religious diversity about which you just spoke at the United Nations. We, who have the honor of pastoring our people, we work together, we pray together, we meet together, we talk to one another, and we try to serve as one the city we are proud to call our earthly home while awaiting our true and eternal residence in heaven. So very often do we recall the faith of the psalmist, God is in the midst of the city. And your prayer and your presence and your words this morning inspire us. So thank you for being here. I don't know if you really caught that or not. I'm sure many of you will. And that is that God was in the midst of our city. And uh, basically, he's implying, Pope Francis has come, that he's implying him to be God in the midst of the city. Very sickening, if you ask me. But, uh, but what can you expect there? Another one that I want to share with you before I go into the biblical account tonight, this is from The Trumpet. Brad McDonald writes this, a columnist, uh, speaking about why is the Pope provoking war in Israel? All right, he says, first the Cuban, now the Palestinians. The Pope is Francis is a man on a mission, but what is his mission exactly? The rhetoric and body language, the gracious gestures and the incessant smiles and compliments give the impression of a selfless leader determined to broker peace, cooperation, and tranquility in Cuba, Israel, all over this chaotic, disunited planet. But consider the decisions and actions of both Cuba and Israel. The Vatican is creating tension, disunity, and stability that are likely to lead to a conflict and war. Yesterday, the Vatican revealed that it had formally recognize the state of Palestine and a newly finalized treaty with the Palestinians. Pope Francis and the Vatican had previously supported as the state of Palestine, but never formally like this. The treaty defines the Catholic Church's activities in areas controlled by the Palestinians and will be signed by both sides this Saturday when the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas visits the Vatican. Of course, we know this has already been done, cleared, and officially taken care of back in January of 2016. 
Critics of Israel's and patrons of the Palestinian state are elated. The movement to recognize the Palestinian state has gained momentum in recent years, particularly within the United Nations. An endorsement from the Pope and the Vatican is huge time will tell, but gaining the support of the most uh, respected and admired leader of the earth could be just what is needed to get the project of the Palestinian statehood over the finish line. For the Jewish state and its declining number of supporters, the Vatican's decision was an enormous blow. This move does not promote the peace process and distances the Palestinian leadership from returning to direct and bilateral negotiations, Israel's foreign minister said in a text message to the Associated Press. Indeed, in return for its vital support of the Palestinian statehood, the Vatican required absolutely nothing from the Palestinians. There was no requirement of the Palestinian Authority to sincerely engage in peace talks with Israel, no demand it recognizes Israel's right to exist, no demand that it sever its connection with Hamas and publicly renounce Hamas's ambitions. Nothing. The one thing we can be assured it won't do is to improve the chances for peace, ex explained Jonathan Tobin, senior online editor of the Commentary magazine. By granting the Palestinian official recognition without first requiring them to, to make peace with Israel, Pope Francis and the Church have made it less likely that this will ever happen. Others will more dramatically, Abraham Foxman, national director of the Anti-Defamation League, released a statement saying that the Vatican's actions serve to undermine the only real solution of the decades-old conflict. Morton Klein, president of the Zionist Organization of America, warned that the Vatican's endorsement of the Palestinian state was a sign of the resurgence of the historical Catholic enmity toward Jews. Now, I can't agree more. I really could not agree more with these statements that are being said here. And quite frankly, friends, we are, are you're, you're fixing to see a lot of the reasons why when we look at some uh, prophetic insights here from the book of Daniel, things that I wanted to share with you that might lend to some of the reasoning behind all of this. Let's go right into Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, into Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, you know, it's kind of funny, history only repeated itself. And those of you that know, Babylon today, or Mystery Babylon, as the book of Revelation speaks of, we'll bring that out in just a few minutes, is none other than the, Ro the Roman Catholic Church. And they have taken and brought the part, and notice, even, even Nebuchadnezzar didn't get all of the treasures of Israel's temple, but they got some of those treasures and took them to Babylon and put them in the temple of their own God, in the house of their treasures. Well, the Vatican is loaded with golden treasures, unbelievable, and we hear in the book of Obadiah, who indicts the Catholic Church for doing it, Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Well, Obadiah clearly indicts Rome as we see the Ark of Titus. And by the way, he calls him Edom. If you go back up to about the sixth verse, you find out that Obadiah uh, calls the Romans, the Titus there, as he stood aloof on the other side, as the scripture also says about him. In other words, it wasn't the Syrians, but as we can see, those artifacts, the golden menorah, the pipes, uh, the... the um, uh, I believe it's the shoe bread box, all were carried into Rome. Now, of course, the Vatican was not there at that time. We know that. Titus, uh, the Roman general, took it back, but later those items do fall in Vatican's hand, as it was pointed out by one rabbi from Spain that was given the privilege of seeing it in the catacombs of the Vatican. Maybe a little, uh, you might say, something uh, dangled over him uh, to get his cooperation. He wasn't very cooperative, though. Anyway, looking at Daniel chapter 1, verse 4, children in whom was no blemish, because we go into how that 
he requires for the children of Israel to, that certain of the children of Israel be brought up to him that are wise and have all the knowledge and all these things here. So it says, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such had an ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. All right, now, you're going to find this interesting because, as I said, we know according to the book of Revelation, mystery Babylon is who Babylon is today. It's no longer uh, the Persian kingdom in Iran, but we're speaking about mystery Babylon, and we're going to find out the similarities between the two because Rome certainly has become the dominant world leader just as Nebuchadnezzar was back in his day. As you've seen in just some of the evidences we've just shown you, even those that are against the Catholic Church, the Jewish writers that are writing against the Catholic Church there, against this peace initiative that the Pope is doing, and of course the Palestinian state, they call him the greatest leader on the earth. That's everywhere. Time Magazine makes him man of the year. We get on and on and on with these things here. But you know, they brought these, these wise men in. And by the way, one thing you might not know about is, did you know they're there in Nazi Germany? They grabbed up the Jews that knew science, archaeology, all kinds of wisdom and knowledge. And what did, what did this crazy Hitler want of them? He wanted them deciphering the codes of the ancient Babylonian empires and the ancient empires even before Babylon, the Egyptians and everything else. He was trying to decipher how the great things that were made in the earlier civilizations. He was using them, much like Nebuchadnezzar needed this as well. All right, but notice he teaches them the tongue of the Chaldeans. That's very interesting to say the least there. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such. It's had the ability to them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans, correct? Now, this is interesting. Guess what they've been doing in Israel? This is according to the embassy of Italy in Tel Aviv. See, the Italian embassy in Tel Aviv, recently the possibility of introducing the teaching of the Italian language in various high schools and academic institutes in Israel has been successfully negotiated. For the academic year of 2005-2006, the Italian Cultural Institute in Tel Aviv opened three academic courses in Italian culture and language and the interdisciplinary center in Herzliya. Italian is taught in four of the seven universities in Israel, and Israeli students study medicine, law, science, politics, architecture, and art at Italian universities. You think Babylon is still at work? I think they are. They're still taking the best that Israel has and teaching them everything of the Chaldeans. Today, it's mystery Babylon instead. Let's jump from verse 4 and let's go to verse 6. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Aniatha, Mishael, Azariah, and to whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For they gave unto Daniel the name of Belshazzar, and the Haniah of the Shadrach, and the Mishael, and the Meshach, and Azariah of Abednego. Now that's kind of interesting because it didn't change any. Same thing happened back in the ancient days as well. And even though Daniel and his, the three brothers or companions that he has, their names were changed, it was not made an issue as was the eating of the king's meat. Did you notice that? They never complain about their name being changed. Now, I use this as a type of Yeshua's name. Now, we know that Yeshua's name in Hebrew was Yeshua. Now, some people believe it was Yahshua. Or Yoshua was actually Joshua's name. Yahshua would be putting the Yod, uh, Yod, uh, the Yod at the beginning of the name being the God's divine name, a part of his own divine name. So some people say it's Yahshua, some say it's Yeshua. In the oldest documents that we can find on Yeshua, uh, it is Yeshua. Uh, but that's still up for debate. I, I can understand for saying Yahshua because of the Yod representing uh, God, but there again... We're still trying to pronounce the name of God when Zephaniah's prophecy clearly states to us we will not know that correct pronunciation until, until when? Until Israel's ready to be 
crushed by the world's armies. The armies are surrounded. When God brings them into judgment, that's when we'll know that divine name. Moses and Elijah will reveal it. Remember, Moses, they ask the question to God. They will ask me, Masha, what is his name? What do I tell them? He says, Ihaye Asha Ihaye Shalachani. See, I am that I am has sent me into you. All right, so the point is, they never asked that question, Mashimo, to Moses. We don't have any historical record for this. So therefore, we must conclude that this is still a future prophecy to be fulfilled about Moses. But I found it was interesting because Daniel and them, they never complained anything about their name being changed. But it was, you know, it was more to deal with the fact of the food that they were eating, the meat and the wine that they were drinking. He did not want to be corrupted, as the Bible says, with the king's meat. Now, that brings up a lot of a can of worms, you might say. What kind of meat was the king eating? So... That's a debate that a lot of people really don't care for me to get into. But nonetheless, and by the way, Daniel, when he did his fast, he didn't just fast from the king's meat. He didn't eat the meat, period. Remember, they had to try him for three, what, three and a half years? So they didn't eat the meat, period. They ate the, the what was it, pottage or something like that and drank water. They didn't drink wine or anything. But there is a type about this, though. And this is what I'm wanting you to see. There's a spiritual type that I think is more important than anything that you catch on this. Now, let's move down to Daniel, uh, verse 8 there. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So eat the king's meat, and or drinking the king's wine was a defilement to Daniel, as well as Meshach, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It was a defilement. The changing of the name was not the defilement. So therefore, this is why I say this. Friends, listen. If, you know, some people call uh, Yeshua Jesus, don't condemn him. And, and we can't really say that this was from the, the God of Zeus because you have to understand the name Jesus was not given Back 2,000 years ago during Constantine, this name was actually given a little bit much later in his history. Uh, they were transliterating the name uh, from Hebrew to Greek, Greek using the letter I, Isesus. Uh, uh, you know, I, I prefer Yeshua. I, I just tell it straight out. But I don't think that God is, is much worried about that because he knows he'll restore everything at the end of time. If you look at some of the, uh, like the Syrian Codex, for example, uh, one of the oldest known uh, uh, testaments of the Bible ever written. It's not written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it's, this is where they derive this, their writings from. Uh, we see in there that there is no, you know, you don't have the issue of the name there. All right. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I got my, my mind on another thought at the same time. Anyway, going back here, they didn't want to defile itself with the, the king's meat or drink. Now, this can have direct implications, but the spiritual is very deep as well. And abstaining from the modern-day Babylonian diet is extremely important. I wrote that as a note. Now, what am I talking about here? The spiritual application of he didn't eat the, meat, the king's meat nor drink his drink. See, remember, what, what did Yeshua say in Matthew 16, 11, and 12? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning the bread that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Uh, then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. You see, that is the meat that they're offering to you today, the wine that they're offering to you in the communion service of the Catholic Church they're also willing to make this as a universal thing. The Pope is even lifting this up now. He's allowing the Lutherans to start partaking of the communion, all right? So the problem is, is the meat that the Babylonians uh, ate and the wine that they drank is the doctrinal uh, leaven that the Catholic Church has added to the Word of God, the interpretation. And that goes right along with all her little Babylonian harlot daughters that she's had since then, which is all the other different religions that are out there. They're all drinking from the same cup and taking of the same false, ungodly leavened bread that they have to offer. And Yeshua warned his own apostles about partaking of that. So 
These are just little clues here and there through the book of Daniel that we see. Now, I want to read to you a little bit more here, and then we're going to look at uh, some other things here. But let's look at, let's jump to chapter 2 in Daniel. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. Now, by the way, what really got me started on this, Sister Jennifer had called with Skype, uh, speaking with my wife earlier today, and they were talking about the story of Joseph from the video I did the other day about Joseph's, um, when he came up there with the butler to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And as I said, Pharaoh's dream is a, was a type of God's word because Joseph said that God gave him the dream. The, the two dreams were one and the same. They were dreams from God to warn him of the things that were coming. But the reason why Pharaoh's uh, sons could not, not Pharaoh's, but Pharaoh's magicians and stuff could not interpret it was because they had imprisoned Joseph, the revealed word for his day. They had imprisoned him for 2,000 years. Just like the Catholic Church has imprisoned Yeshua, the divine interpretation to his word today has been imprisoned for 2,000 years, starting with Constantine, or even before that. But Constantine, when they put together their Mithras religion and they mixed it all together, you know, yes, we have a lot of truth in our Gospels. There's no doubt about it. In fact, the majority of it, there's nothing wrong with it. But there's little bitty things of leaven that got stuck in there that didn't belong there. And they've mixed this all up. And so the divine revelation, when trouble is set in, and we have all kinds of catastrophes facing this earth and world war and things like that, there's no man that can give you the interpretation of the, of the prophecies that are written in the book because they've imprisoned him. They don't want you to know the true way to get into the presence of Almighty God to get the revelations. Now, this is going to get deeper, though, because in Daniel's case, he doesn't even get the dream told to him. See, in the case of Joseph, he's pulled out of prison and then told what the dream said. All right, now we'll go back to Joseph in a moment here. Now, verse 2, the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for it to show the king his dream. So they come and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king, and to Sirach, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing has gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell us the dream and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing has gone from me. But if you will not make known to me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me. Notice those words were already prepared. Till the time be changed, therefore tell me the dream, and I shall, shall, shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Now, in the case with Joseph, the butler, when he was in prison along with the baker, he interpreted their dreams. They told him his dreams, he interpreted them, and they came to pass exactly the way it was. Now, Joseph tells the butler, this is jumping back to the story in Genesis now, but right now we're looking at Daniel as well, but... In the story of Genesis, Joseph takes, tells the butler, who is the man that holds the wine cup for the king, which is a type of the Catholic Church today. The Pope of Rome claims to be bearing the cup for Jesus to the multitudes. See? And wine does represent a stimulant. But see, God doesn't need a false stimulant to give revelation. 
This is why Daniel abstained from the king's wine. He doesn't want an intoxicant to cause him to get a revelation. He wants the re direct revelation from God. That's why a Nazarite vow was taken and they abstained from meat and they abstained from wine and they didn't drink any of these things or they didn't eat the meats. They stayed with the vegetables the way God had given it originally in the Garden of Eden. All right. Now, here's the thing, though. In this case here, Joseph says to the butler, remember me when you come into the presence of the king. But he doesn't remember him. Instead, he leaves him in the prison for two more years. And those two years represent the 2,000 years the Catholic Church has allowed the true anointed word of God that could reveal the things that are hidden in this book here. You know, when Yeshua was here, he was telling the people what his word really meant. Remember what he says? If you knew what this meant, you would have not have bound the guiltless. You know, he talks about these things. Another place he says to them, you know, you've heard it said of them all the time, you know, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, if a man takes your coat, give him your cloak also. See, what was it? Yeshua, like it was in the prison with the butler and the baker, he was revealing divine interpretation of the word of God. But instead of the baker, I mean the butler, when he got put into power there, instead of him remembering what the word of God did when he was here on the earth, he forgot all about him and left him there in prison. That's why the Syriac Codex and others make the statement that his words would be hidden until the latter days. That's why Daniel, the angel says to Daniel, seal up the book and write it not. It'll be revealed in the latter days what you're writing here, Daniel. And of course, now we know Daniel chapter 12 is dealing with the two witnesses coming to reveal these words. It's not even a mystery anymore. Why? Because we're living in the latter days of the revelation of his word. All right? Now, so Joseph, right when there is a problem, and the dream that the, kid, that, that, that the Pharaoh has is of God. It is really of God. A true written prophecy. And Pharaoh is ready to kill all of them because they don't know the interpretation of his dream. And they actually got to hear his dream. But they don't know the interpretation of it. Just like they say about Planet X. Planet X, everybody's saying, well, the ancient, the Mayans and everybody else says it's coming. It's, it's been here before and they know it's coming. But there's no man that can reveal what's truly going to happen. Why? Because the Vatican has kept all that hidden from you. They kept Christ locked up in their prison. You know, the catacomb is full of ancient documents. Love to, I'd love to be able to know the Greek language and things like that and be able to go in there and read it. I'd love to be able to read the ones they have in Hebrew. It's like my good friend Gershon Solomon told me. He said, Steve, they found a document hidden there under the Temple Mount that exposes the Vatican, that it's a false religion. And it's, the document was written by early Christians, and he said Yeshua didn't say half the things that the Vatican claims. So, interesting things, to, I have to tell you. But anyway, let's go back to this here. Now, I want you to look at what he says here in verse 9. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For you have prepared lying, corrupt words to speak before me. Did you notice that? They had already pre-prepared corrupted words. Till the time be changed. Oh my God. That's all the way to this day. That's actually a prophecy all the way to this day. Till the time be changed. Remember the other day I shared with you a prophecy uh, from the book of Barak. Barak is actually part of the, uh, I think the Syriac gospel. Or the Syriac Bible. And in there... He states how that in the latter days, time would speed up. Nobody has ever known why all of a sudden time is going faster than normal. You know, everybody thinks, well, it's just, you know, we just think that because we're in modern technology. Well, in the book of Barach, it actually states 
that time will speed up in the latter days because God is ready to hasten his judgment. That's just paraphrasing it. I don't have it in front of me. I wish I did. But here we see, to the time be changed. This is when this is spoken. Corrupt words to speak before me. It makes me think of prophecies Jeremiah spoke of. Now, as I said here, because Joseph was in prison two years, we already talked about this. Today is no different. Yeshua's true words has been held in bondage by the Vatican for 2,000 years. Obadiah's verse 16 proves they hold the cup. Now that's speaking of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is holding that cup of their wine to this day. Now we know this by Obadiah in verse 16 because Obadiah speaks about this. And I thought, let me see, I thought I put that in here. I guess I did not. My apology. Let me read it to you real quick. In Obadiah, uh, uh, verse 1, chapter, uh, verse 1, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 16. There's only one chapter, friends. I, I get that in my head mixed up a lot of times. It says, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down. They shall be as though they had not been. And that was fulfilled when the Pope of Rome had communion service in the upper room on Mount Zion in Israel. It was men only. That is in the masculine plural, the first part of that communion speech there. The second part where it says, and the nation shall drink, they shall, they'll do it continually. That is in the gender inclusive plural. All right, now. This is exactly what happened. And by the way, I told you, if you want to know who it is for sure, go to verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Esau, who hated his brother Jacob. And the Catholic Church still hates the Jews to this day. Why we just read that in that article? It's going to bring up that age-old hatred of the Jews. Esau and Jacob. That's exactly what happens. So Jeremiah prophesied before the captivity of Daniel is during the captivity. Oh, I just want to bring this out for you too. Jeremiah prophesied before the captivity of Daniel is during the captivity born around 25 to 30 years after Jeremiah. In other words, Jeremiah and Daniel, because we're looking at the prophecies of Jeremiah and Daniel. Uh, and I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, okay, now let's go over to Daniel. Uh, let's drop down to verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? All right. Daniel answers in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king hath, de hath demanded cannot the wise men the astrologers and the magicians and the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. You see, even Daniel knows it's in the latter days. Just as I showed you right there in verse, uh, verse 9. Till the time be changed. See, corrupt words to see. See, they had prepared corrupt words. These false teachers who are not true teachers like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. See, these were, these were the true teachers of God. But they brought in a bunch of corrupt words to speak to Daniel. And they were all false. And he says that they would be for the latter days. This is what his prophecy is. Now look at, look at Zechariah 8, 20, verse 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of the languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, I brought this scripture in here for a purpose, because notice, in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, none of the Gentiles had the answers, friends. The only one that had the answer were the Jews. And it speaks in Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23, that the day is going to come that ten people of the nations are going to take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, show us your ways. We heard that God is with you. Now, friends, this has nothing to do with the Jewish nation right now and, and them trying to take you back into Judaism of 613 laws. That's not what he's talking about. You know, if Yeshua says that I will write my laws upon your heart. Do you think you can memorize 613 laws? No, you cannot. 
When you write them upon your heart, it's because you can remember them. I think you can really remember the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments and two statutes is what Moses gave. It's funny, Yeshua does the same thing. You know, it even says in the book of Revelations, you know, the book of Revelation, those that, 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 that believe in Jesus Christ and keep his commandments or keep the commandments. John speaks about his commandments, talking about Yeshua, that he gave commandments. Well, he gave the commandments like Moses did. Mm. My gosh, friend. So it's the two witnesses is what this is speaking of right here in Zechariah 8, 23. He's speaking about the two witnesses. Why? Because none of these priests and prophets and all that you have in the land, none of them have the answer. They're a bunch of, they do nothing but they lie to you and they make up a bunch of stuff and they, they've been writing up, they got things all pre-prepared and everything. It's all a bunch of lies. My gosh, friends. If you drop down to verse 43, another one I marked here. And whereas thou sawest from, you know, because we know, you know, you guys already know, I believe you guys already know the whole story here. And I apologize if the print's not big enough here. I tried to make one side bigger and I was kind of in a rush and couldn't get it big enough. But it's Daniel chapter 2, verse 43. This, Daniel's already told him about the entire vision, the head of the gold, and, the, you know, it gets all the way down to the feet, and the feet are made of both clay and iron. Okay, it says, Wherefore, as thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This is what the Pope is doing with trying to bring together all the world's religions. Not just the world religion, trying to bring all the political leaders together as well. He's mingling, he's trying to mingle themselves with the seed of men. One, he's all corrupted as it is, so it doesn't matter. But who is, who really is this, mis who is Babylon there? See, this is, this is talking about the iron and the clay of the latter day. Let's see who he is, Revelation 17, 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, uh, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls and having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And by the way, remember, if you remember, Brother Chris, I shared with you his video, uh, uh, Let's see, what is Chris's channel? Code, code Searcher or, or Code uh, Something Theory. Gosh, forgive me, Brother Chris. I, uh, my mind's blank on it right now. But anyway, Code, code Search uh, Theory or Code Search Theory Research, something like that. Anyway, Chris's channel there, he spoke about how that even the same colors that are worn here in Revelation of this woman here are the same colors that are worn by uh, Aaron's high priest. And so they're trying to make the Pope of Rome as the high priest, even for Israel. Because remember, that whole united, even the Jews were there, and this big one world religion uniting, the thing that Lisa brought out there, what do we find? They all united, united underneath the papacy. So he is making himself to be God on earth. And y'all are looking for an antichrist from somewhere else. Why? Is everybody that blind? You see this, but you're that blind. All right. And upon her forehead it was written, was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Oh my gosh, friends. I don't see how anybody misses this. I really don't. I pulled this up. I wanted you to see this as well. In amazingdiscoveries.org, it says here, influential American pastor Rick Warren spends much of his time fighting for social justice and participating in political groups and discussion. He believes everyone must work together for peace, that all religions must unite and with the help of global government solve poverty and corruption. The unity Warren is propo uh, proposing fits perfectly in the New World Order uh, paradigm and the papacy in the United Nations. Uh, uh, ecumenicalism among Christians and across religions is, is one small part of a huge initiative towards a global government and a global religion that satisfies them all. Sure it is. It's exactly what they want. Daniel chapter 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. 
again. Now, Belshazzar, by the way, was Nebuchadnezzar's son. He makes that great feast and he drinks the wine before him. Uh, there again, notice there's always that wine drinking. Why? Because Mystery Babylon continues to carry the cup of Babylon to this day. They're a Babylonian religion. And just like the Babylonians, when they got the Jews down into Babylon, they tried to pervert the Jewish people as well. There was very few, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that stood and kept the true faith of God while they were in captivity. Imagine how many of them fell for the, you know, because of fear of being put to death under the king's command. We know of five that didn't, but what about the rest? Okay, now, Belshazzar, while as he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein. See? Notice, princes, wives, and his concubines might drink therein. And they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and, and praised the gods of gold and silver and brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Did Pope Francis say Lutherans can take communion as Catholics? See? Belshazzar, his princes, and his wives. The princes, by the way, of the Catholic Church are the cardinals. They're called the princes of the church. Yes, they can take communion. His wives, that's the Catholic people themselves. His concubine is none other than the Lutheran Church, directly married to the Catholic Church, who also wear the goofy little white thing stuck in their collar where you can run around like this with a little square there. The Lutherans do that. That's the concubines to the Catholic Church. They marry back to the Catholic Church. They are the concubines. You don't see the scripture laying it out plainly, laying it out right for you. See, this is the Vatican's concubines. Now, this is on, uh, uh, it's a share on Facebook uh, by David Gibson, Religious News Service, November 23rd of 2015. Pope Francis has not uh, knocked for setting traditional teeth on edge with unscripted musings on sacred topics. He recently did it again when he seemed to suggest that a Lutheran could receive communion in the Catholic Church after consulting her conscience. The exchange came up during a prayer service on November 15th at a Lutheran church in Rome that had invited the pontiff. And he used the occasion to engage in a question and answer session with some of the congregants. And by the way, they've been doing it ever since. Lutherans are now taking of the Catholic Church of their little communion service. Friends, we're living in a late hour. A very late hour. And I do believe that God is going to put His two witnesses right before the world very soon. I don't think it's a question of whether or not they're here on the earth. I believe they are. But the revealing of who they are is yet to be made public. God's not revealed who they are. I don't know who they are, but I believe they are here. I've had a lot of people send me their thoughts of who they thought they were. You know, different guys, one guy out of Africa and stuff like that. I do not believe that at all. I believe that when God reveals them, one, the world is going to hate them. That's one thing's guaranteed. The world religious leaders will hate them as well. There's going to be very few that will really believe the message they bring. I'm Stephen Benoon. We are living in an ecumenical time. And it won't be long. You won't be able to buy or sell unless you agree with this one world religious system that's coming. I'm Stephen Benoon with Israeli News Live, a prophetic segment of our broadcast. Shalom. Shalom.